And welcome to another episode of the Raw Shock Test Podcast. I am your host, Terrell James. Today, I got a special guest with me, Dan Hank. How you doing today, man? Good, good. That's good. That's good, man. Glad to hear that. Um, I was, um, you know, when I, I came across your story before I got a chance to meet you, and I was like super excited about wanting to uh to to podcast and the interview with you so i reached out to you and then you reached back and i said yes yes i'm so glad <laughs> that we have an opportunity to make this thing happen man so um so what i do here on the royal shock test i'm going to put up a series of uh royal shock tests or ink blots and i'm going to ask dan what he sees now based off of what he sees i'm going to connect it to the things that he does for a living and his passions um but before we get into all of that dan just tell me a little bit about what you do and who you are um i'm a writer and artist uh, i own a tattoo shop and i do mma um that's probably the short version <laughs> <laughs> I, i've always been a writer and artist so i, I kind of that's you know my biggest passion but uh I used to I used to get beat up a lot when I was like a teenager because I was like super punk rock and living in the south and you know jocks would like drive by the pickup truck and call you things and you know you would scream back stuff about their mom and then they'd all get up you know? <laughs> so I was like I gotta learn how to fight so like at the time like I, I was a pretty heavy drinker I stopped drinking I was a pretty heavy smoker I stopped smoking and started working out hated all of it but i was like i i'm trying to get my ass beat <laughs> you know and then like pretty much anything i get into i get into it like ocd like over the top so right. then i got into you know i got into all that stuff and i really got into martial arts i, I really got into bruce lee stuff i read his book the tao g and stuff and i've been wrong with that ever since so but still art and writing is my passion but that's just something that i really got into as well okay all right and and so and you're a tattoo artist as well that's correct yeah i, I started tattooing originally because uh, i moved to new york city to be a comic artist and they're really restrictive on what they let you do and how you express yourself and stuff like that so i started doing some album covers they weren't really paying much i was doing other stuff for like you know clubs and stuff and like it's hit or miss with they pay the first time i made consistent money is when i started tattooing and I started tattooing just until I got a, quote, real job. But then I really liked it. And, you know, tattooing's evolved a lot. Like, it used to be, like, little simple stuff. Now I do whole back pieces and sleeves and stuff. And I like the community. I like doing it. I'm heavily tattooed myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other thing, you are a podcaster as well. That's correct, yeah. I, I started a podcasting, and, like, I... I it's one of the things like martial arts. I go, I wasn't sure about it at first, and then I got into it. And then I kind of liked it, you know, but I, I didn't really know where to go with it. And then um, because I'm a writer and because there are a lot of artists that were amazing artists, but have struggled with all sorts of stuff from companies to production to whatever. So I was like, why don't I just talk to them? And we talk about experiences and what's going on. And uh, I feel like you kind of found my groove with that, uh, and I'm doing that. And I, I think hopefully every episode is getting better, and I'm, I'm getting some uh, some people that I really admired growing up that are suddenly appearing on my podcast. I'm like, wow, I'd love to talk to you. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's cool, man. It's, it's so cool, you know, when you get that podcast and you're able to, uh, you know, your voice is far reaching at that point, and then it starts falling on the ears of the people that you admire or the people that you have a, a certain degree of respect for. Um, and then they want to be a part of it. That's, you know, that that's cool. It's like this, this validate it's, it's validation that you didn't know that you needed or even wanted, you know, right. that you don't necessarily get into it for that reason, but it just feels good though. It definitely feels good. Well, it, it does, it does give you validation, especially like when, when you talk to you know other artists or authors and they're like oh i like your stuff and you're like wow i looked up to this guy you know they like my stuff this is awesome yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah that is pretty cool okay man so look we're going to go ahead and get into uh one of these pictures now so i'm going to put this picture up and i want you to just uh say again exactly what you see it looks like a. it looks like a angry angel of death attacking me 
Okay. <laughs> so I believe what you said before um, was uh, two warrior angels attacking you. Well, I, no, I, I said uh, you, you gave me another one. I said that was two. This one I just said it was one, but it's like, yeah, a warrior angel attacking me. Okay, warrior angel attacking you. Okay, okay. So, um, so let's start here. Um, a warrior angel attacking you. Um, I want to. I want to go back into uh, childhood, um, even adolescence, actually. I do want to go back there, but this could really apply to any point in your life, okay? When I think about oh, an angel attacking, I think of an angel not necessarily attacking you, but attacking a demon. So I want to talk about wrestling with demons and the demons that you may have had to fight. So, right. So uh, that angel I, I would, I would, uh, I think, uh, you know, I have a slightly different inspiration on that. Mm -hmm. Just because here's the reason why is because my parents are super conservative, mm -hmm. super military, and super religious. Like they made me go to church four times a week as a kid. They made me go to psychiatrists when mm -hmm. I was punk rock. They were like super against that. They thought it was inspired by Satan or something. <laughs> right. Like so, I don't I don't really believe in any of that stuff. You know, I, I'm an atheist, but it, it's. Not that I think that like the angel is attacking my demons per se. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I don't have demons, but I think it's more like I don't see them as friendly entities. And it's like I, I felt like that crush of religion and oppression on mm -hmm. me. Okay. So then in that case, let's talk about just the demons that you've had to wrestle with then. Okay. So so tell me a little bit about, about those demons that you've had to wrestle with. Uh, well, there, there are things that are bad things that happen in my life, and there are things that you know are obvious demons. Um, I, I think that the there's more of this bad stuff that's happened in my life. It's like a like bad chance, bad coincidence, basically bad luck. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like my wife died in a hit and run. Um, I came down with brain cancer. Um, I was in the car that flipped. Um, I've actually been in eight bike wrecks. I've towed three of them. <laughs> yeah. wow. um, I was, uh, I was bicycling when I lived in Texas for a while, which I, I, I don't advise moving to Texas, but I, I lived in Austin, Texas, which is the only place I would live in, in Texas. And some lady was texting and she's plowed in me with a car. Hmm. Uh, I went backwards over the hood through the windshield and I woke up in the hospital. Wow. So how did that affect you though? Like if we if we were to call those demons or wrestling with demons, like how does that affect you? I, don't know, I mean, may, maybe it's because you know I feel like my whole life I had to kind of fight to be who I am, mm -hmm. like you know, so like like you know being a punk rocker and being into what I was into and my parents being super conservative and all that stuff, you know. So it's like everything that happens, I just feel like. How am I going to get past it? Like, like I try to make some pathway to get out of it, to get past it. Like, mm -hmm. even when I had brain cancer, I remember, like, um, the, I just started going out with this girl. And, uh, you know, I, I was having horrible headaches. And I go in, and they're like, what do you do? And I said, I do Muay Thai. They said, oh, it's a brain bleed. They put me in the cat scan. They go, oh, wait, it's cancer. And then they're like, we have to operate right away. Like, two more weeks, you would have been dead. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's it's brain surgery, so you have about 50, 50 chance of making it, you know. And at, at the time, like I had these horrible headaches, like it felt like I had a jackhammer on the back of my head. Mm -hmm. So it was just like it's like okay, okay, because at, at least they knew what it was; they could address it, you know. And I remember she broke down; she was crying. She's like, "You don't care." I'm like, "Well, of course I care, but what else am I going to do?" <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And then when I was going through um, chemotherapy after that, they said, like, they run a pathology on it to see if it's malignant or benign. And uh, it was malignant, which means it's cancer. So they have to give you radiation and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is brutal, by the way. But uh, the whole time I was going through chemotherapy, um, I was still going to the gym, like, three times a week. I was still working three days a week, you know. And, like, when I go to the gym, I lived in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and I'd bike over the bridge. So I, I'd be biking to the gym. So I'd like stop on the bridge and I'd be throwing up on the side of the bridge and then mm. I'd keep biking to the gym. 
and I'd be working out, and then I have to go and throw up in the trash can, and then you know work out some more. But I kind of had that feeling of like, if you give up, that's the end of it. Like nobody cares except for you. Like mm-hmm. end of the day, nobody really cares if you make it except for you. Well, I have a different view on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I think it it really depends on you know, the people that you have around you and how they feel about you. You know, I think, you know, you know, people are affected if you don't make it. You know, I mean, I, I mean I'm not close <laughs> to my family at all, so that might be part of it. Okay, I can understand that then. Okay, yeah, but I do think that you would probably be surprised at the amount of lives that you have probably touched, and the people who would fill that void, feel that loss if something happened to you. It's true, but uh, all right. Here, here's my perspective on it. Um, so, my my wife who died to hand to run, um, she's a beautiful immigrant from Colombia. Like uh, every, everybody was like, oh, she's stunning. She's so well spoken. She's so nice. She was a talented artist. So, mm-hmm. like nothing but accolades for her. Like everybody loved her basically. And then when she died, it was you know in all the papers and all the press, a horrible tragedy we did in our show. We, we raised funds, you know, to hire a uh, PI to go after the guy. Um, we couldn't find out who did it, but like we know the make of the car, but we hired a PI to try and find out who it was. So mm-hmm. all this stuff happened and it was a huge, huge event, but it was a huge event. And then it seems like it kind of like died out. Like I still remember her like occasionally, you know, I'll post stuff and, and I'm still sad about it. You know, like I, I spent years of my life with her, but, you know, other people, I, I don't think they even really remember until I, I jog their memory. Right. Yeah. And and I get that. It's like for everybody else, life goes on, but you're still stuck dealing with the loss. Right. And the pain because it, hit, it hits you the hardest because you're the closest to the situation. So I, I get that. I do understand that. Like, yeah. even her family, like, her family, um, I think I said, like, you know, she was a recent immigrant from Colombia, and her family, like, they're thrown by terrorists down there. Her dad was a military commander down there, mm-hmm. you know, but her family, they loved me. So, like, my own family, they didn't even visit me in the hospital when I had cancer. Wow. <laughs> That's what shitty people they are. Mm. They, they, they kicked me out of the house, and they moved. <laughs> like you know wow. like the day i graduated high school yeah but uh her family loved me but like i never really talked to them anymore like when i see them they're all friendly and they they like to see me but we don't really stay in touch that much like mm-hmm. even her brother um he also owns a tattoo shop he owns a tattoo shop in baltimore and we used to like kind of talk on a regular basis for the first couple of years but now that it's been over a decade, we rarely talk. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I guess because they don't have that connection to you through her any more than I don't know. I can't speak for them, but you know, I but I, I do understand you still um you still feeling that void. So I'm still fi- feeling that lost and um, that loss and then other people not really feeling it the way that you feel it. So, yeah, you can post about it. People can sympathize, but they can't empathize unless right. they've been in, in, in your shoes. Well, that's you know? a good way of putting it. Sympathize, not empathize. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I get it. So, OK, so let's I want to talk about tattooing now, but I still want to stick with that same um, that that angel attacking you. Okay. okay. So you've been attacked before. You've been stabbed. Yeah. So yeah, I got a fight with the crackhead. <laughs> it uh, <laughs> severed the tendon on my thumb. Oh yeah. wow, wow. So all right, my question to you now about being attacked and tattooing: Do you ever have PTSD when you're tattooing somebody because you're sticking them with something that is causing them to bleed? No. Okay. It, it, it's entirely unrelated. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, a lot of people are kind of surprised by this, but like, you know, people will be covered in tattoos and they go in to the doctor and they get a shot and they almost pass out. People right. are like, you know, what's going on? And it's totally different. Like yeah. tattoo needles, they only go in the second layer of skin. That's it. Right. 
Like mm-hmm. actual needles go all the way down into your vein. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was um I was actually as I was trying to come up with my questions, I that just kind of it, it just popped into my head and I and I said, Wow, I I wonder if ever you're sitting there and you're tattooing somebody and you just kind of get a flashback of that moment but that's good to know especially for the person getting tattooed because the last thing they wanted for you to start having people oh, yeah, start freaking out <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay so my next question still want to talk about uh tattooing here and still sticking with that angel attacking you so let's say i came to you and i kind of feel like i already know the answer to this question but i'm going to ask you anyway so Let's say I came to you and I said, hey, I want a tattoo of an angel attacking a demon. Right. We, in it's order actually for, a very common theme. Really? Yeah. Okay. So in order for you to do that, and, and you saying that it's a very common theme, that further just knows, that lets me know, I already know the answer to this question. But <laughs> in order for you to do that type of tattoo, do you have to go to a dark place to create that scene? Not really. I mean, th- there are kind of two things to go into this. Um, one is I own a shop and I do a lot of stuff. So I tattoo like three days a week. And most of what I tattoo are like full back pieces and full sleeves. There are people who have been getting tattooed by me for like 15 years straight. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of selective. Like, I, it's not like I have to do your tattoo. It's like, you come, you talk to me, you know, I like what, what you want, you like what I want to do, and, and we work it out, and then, you know, it, it's a process from there. Plus, people tend to look at my portfolio, and mm-hmm. I'm kind of like the horror guy. You know, the horror, the horror and also, I, I've been, uh, like, probably for about the last, you know, seven, eight years, also the space guy. So people come to me for either horror or space related stuff. Gotcha. And I've done like full sleeves of just space. I've done full sleeves of like Star Wars. I've mm-hmm. done yeah, full I've sleeves seen. of like, you know, mm-hmm. Resident Evil. You know, so, it, you know, it, it's usually those two genres. So I don't really get as many like, you know, um, th- those were, I don't know what the word really would be for that, but those are more like one shot images. And I don't really do one shot images nearly as much. Got you. Okay. All right. So I want to move on to another picture. So right here. Right. So what did you say you saw here? I said I saw two dogs, like, you know, when when dogs like kind of sniff each other out and they kind of like get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Although I got to say that at first I was like, it looks a little bit more like two ducks to me. (laughs) <laughs> but ducks don't really like sniff each other out. So, right. you know, the actions would be more like dogs. It was just a single image. I would say a duck. Okay. So, well, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the dogs now. <laughs> so, <laughs> because that's what I prepared for. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so when uh, two dogs are sniffing each other out. Well, first, let me just start here. So dogs are loyal. But right. typically not to other dogs, they're loyal to their owners. They right. see other dogs and then they begin barking. They're ready to fight. They're ready to bite. So right. uh, my question to you is how often have you had to, or have you ever had to sniff somebody out because they were supposed to be loyal to you, but essentially what happened was they ended up biting you. It, that definitely has happened. Um, I think more often than not, I tend to be uh, like a little bit too like a, I don't know if it's too generous or too, you know, whatever. Like I, I try and like see through other people's eyes and like see why they did something they did. But there are some people that they, they just do stuff to you that like infuriates you that you just can't forgive. Right. You know, like I, I had a, a pretty probably fairly extreme example is um, I had a good friend that I went to high school with and we stayed friends after that. And then he developed a heroin addiction. And I, you know, I I said, once you, you know, once he got heavy into the drugs, I was like, you're not allowed in my house anymore. But my roommate at the time was also friends with this guy. You know, we all were, you know, high school friends. 
And so he came over to see my friend. And one time when he came over to see my friend, he stole everybody's rent money. Hmm. You know, so then we made a little trip to his house and uh, <laughs> they, they, they were down. There. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can tell me the rest of that story off air. <laughs> so, okay. So I still want to stick with those, those dogs, but I want to talk about you being a writer. Now you being an author. Okay. So, um, when dogs are sniffing each other out, they're trying to find something out. Right. So when you began writing, were you trying to find something? Were you trying to find your voice? Were you trying to find an explanation for the story, for your story? Or were you just, or did you just decide, I just want to write? I was definitely trying to, like, well, I'll go back a little bit. Like, um, I couldn't decide if I wanted to be an artist or a writer. Mm -hmm. And then I read the first really advanced comic books, like Watchmen and The Dark Guy Rises, or, or The Dark Guy Returns, rather. And uh, I was like, oh, I can do both. I can do art and I can do writing. And uh, so it turns out that's a lot harder than <laughs> I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed with DC Comics and Marvel Comics and Image Comics and stuff. Everybody, they want you to be an artist or they want you to be a writer. It's kind of like you, you kind of luck into doing both. Like maybe the writer quits and, you know, they're like, oh, we'll give you a shot, kid, or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so when... when I started, like, I always wanted to write, but, you know, people see your art skills long before they see your writing skills, usually, and right. everybody, especially, like, in the punk scene and the, the metalcore scene and stuff like that, you know, they, they all want you to do artwork for their, their albums or for their t-shirts or for, you know, I, I did, like, club artwork and stuff like that, and, and so I was, like, when I got down to writing, I was, like, how am I going to break through? Like I, I took like advanced, like writing classes and stuff in school, but I was like, I, you know, what really like makes you expressive as a writer. And I think I've narrowed that over time. Like, you know, I, I now put out three novels and chapbooks and short stories. And I think as you go along, your writing gets a little bit more fluid, a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the most dramatic in, improvement was, you know, when I first started out and I was really trying to debate on how to do everything and I really don't like it when people don't describe anything like mm -hmm. those, they'll, you know, they'll be in like some weird alien world. Like you can't picture anything, but they just don't, Oh yeah, that was strange. And then they don't talk about it. And you're like, yeah, man, you got to give me a little more to work with. Right. So, you know, in the beginning I was trying really hard to describe everything and being an artist too, you're like, you're visualizing everything. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I, I've scaled that back a little bit, so I think it makes the story more fluid. So mm -hmm. I, I think I think that helps. And I, that's probably my biggest evolution as a writer. Okay, so um, another thing about those dogs, when the dogs are sniffing each other out, once they come across something that they don't like, they immediately become aggressive. Right. So uh, you don't go through the things that you've gone through without a great deal of aggression being created. So how much of that aggression do you put into your writing? I don't know. That, that's a good question. And I wouldn't even say it's aggression as so much as I would say it's like really uh, hard incidents, like really weedy incidents, you know, because I'm not, I'm not a person who like snaps to aggression. Like, like my parents were, so maybe I got it from them, you mm. know, but it, it's more like I try to like, even when I get really mad at something, like like when I, when I first started boxing and I get punched in the nose and you get mad at the other person, but <laughs> I, I think it, it helps if, if you like take a back seat and you go, what's the best way to deal with this? So the right. best way in boxing is then to go, oh, I got punched in the nose, ah! you know, it's, you got to use technique, you know. So mm -hmm. it's the same thing with anything that happens. You got to figure out the technique to best approach it. And right. even when somebody does something that's real grimy, you're like, yeah, what's the best way to deal with that? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why I said to do. Okay. So when I'm writing, like, you know, it's, it's a little bit different in some ways because you use different characters and they probably have different personalities. Mm -hmm. But I, I try to like, not 
immediately jump to something. I tried to go, well, maybe this was going on. Maybe that was going on. Maybe this influenced the actions. And I tried to make it progress from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you don't necessarily take your own aggression. Oh, well, well, let me ask you that. Would you say that you don't really have that much aggression inside of you, despite the things that you've been through? I do, but I think it comes out in like weird ways. Uh, okay. Like, for instance, you know, like I like to work on vehicles and like I'll be working my truck and I'll like slam my finger. I'll be like, motherfucker, and I throw down the ratchet. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, now I got to like dig pebbles and dirt out of that ratchet, you know, but <laughs> I'm not going to throw it through the windshield of the car or like in the door and like, right. you know, permanently damage the car. You know, I'm not going to like, you know, punch my dog or something, you know, <laughs> it's like. So it, it, it's, I don't know, it, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you ever see those superheroes where they get like, you know, somebody shoots them with a whole bunch of energy and they mm -hmm. try to find somewhere to release it where it's like does the least damage possible. Uh -huh. I kind of try and do that because I, I know yeah. like sometimes you can't help it wells up in you, but I, I try and find some release. It's not going to fuck me over in the long term. Right. Okay. But it doesn't go into your writing at all, though. No, I think, I mean, I think that most people would say if they read, you know, my writing, like it, some of it gets like fairly extreme, like not extreme, like as in like, you know, uh, you know, like, like, holy shit, you know, I, you know, it's more like, you know, it gets so, like, if there's violence, like it gets more violent and more violent and more violent. And they're like, wow, they got, they got really over the top, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like, I don't know, maybe I, I see like dark tendencies where things like end up, you know, going further than you thought they would. But mm -hmm. I don't necessarily, I try not to sit down and like jump to anything. Okay. All right. So I want to move on to the third picture that I sent you. Okay. Right here. Okay. What did you say you saw here? I saw two, um, like old men they were kind of like you know cackling and kind of hunched over and like you know mm. like judging you as they walk by <laughs> <laughs> but the two old men are laughing yeah mm. but i think it, they're not laughing because they see humor they're laughing because they don't like what they see or they're making fun of what they see right okay okay so all right so my question to you is with everything that you've been through in your life, because you've been through a lot, have you ever felt like you were the butt of a joke? Of, were you, do you ever feel like you were the butt of life's joke and that people are just sitting around laughing at you? I don't feel like I'm the butt of life's joke and people are just sitting around laughing at me, but I feel there are incidents where, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't help when you're like 16, 17, you have like a blue mohawk and, you know, like mm -hmm. spiky little jacket and you live in the South and like everybody's, you know, they're like they're making fun of you or they're, they're like, they're saying shit to you or, or whatever. So it's like, I don't feel like I'm the butt of their joke, but I feel like, you know, a lot of people are like a little bit more malicious than, you know, than they pretend to be. Okay. Okay. All right. I want to put the picture back up for a second because I want people to really understand what I'm about to say. So in this picture, the men are back to back. So right. let's, so we're going to say that one of these men represents you. Um, if one of these men is you, then that means that there's someone behind your back who's laughing, but you are looking for it and you are laughing as well, which means you aren't concerned with what's going on behind you and you were using your voice to get the last laugh. So what I want to do is I want to talk about podcasting now. How are you using your platform, your voice on your platform to get the last laugh while leaving and ignoring behind everything that is going on? Well, I would agree that um, to some extent I tried to, leave stuff behind and ignore it and whatever like uh like it really bothers my girl when i'll go in the gym and like like my whole head's tattooed mm -hmm. you know 
So I, I'll go into the gym and, you know, I'm not wearing a hat and like people are staring, you know, she's like, oh, you know, people are staring. And I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, so, so that kind of stuff, I, I tried to like, you know, like write it off and not let it bother me. Mm-hmm. But it, it's not like I'm like, oh, it's fucking normal people. You know, it's like, it just, it, you know, it, it's like, it's not worth my time. Mm-hmm. So, so you don't use your, your platform, I'm saying I mean, your podcast here, you don't use your podcast as a way of getting the last laugh where it's like, ha, I have a platform, I have a voice, I can do and say whatever it is that I want to say, regardless of your judgments, regardless of your ridicule, regardless of things that have happened in my past. No, I don't think so. Actually, I think that I have a whole different approach to it, which is mm-hmm. I love stories. You know, okay. like, like I am a writer, but I'm also a heavy reader. I watch movies. I watch tons of shows on Netflix and stuff. And, and I love a good story. So I really want to see where people are coming from. What mm-hmm. inspires you to do that? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to tell people? I, I want to know. Okay. Okay, cool. So um, another question about uh, podcasting and your platform so on your platform, you are actually able to sit with somebody who may have dealt with a great deal of pain the same way that you have dealt with a great deal of pain. What does it do to you mentally and emotionally to know that both of you can sit there on this platform, use your voices and actually laugh? And I'm still dealing with what you said. You saw the two old men laughing. And I know what you saw was them laughing at somebody. It was more of um a condescending laugh but right. i'm kind of pulling it away from the condescending part but still dealing with the laugh here so how does that how does that affect you mentally and emotionally knowing that you and somebody else who who has also dealt with pain can sit on your platform knowing the things that you both have been through but you can laugh now well i i think that if you've gone through a decent amount it gives you like a depth of character so mm-hmm. you know that probably makes it more interesting like mm-hmm. if you talk to somebody like i, I remember on my podcast um, fairly recently I, I had a guy who really hasn't done much of anything he's uh, like he just lived the same place his entire life you know he, like he writes stories but he doesn't go out he doesn't you know so it's like i i didn't find much connection with him but mm-hmm. you know then there's another guy that i talked to he was like yeah i lived in france for a little while now i live in mexico then like and we had this great conversation. It's like, oh, what was that like? Oh, what was going on there? So, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it's like, it, it seems like when you've gone through stuff, it, it, it makes you interesting. But if you get too hyper emotional about it, I mean, it, it kind of loses me. I mean, maybe right. because I don't tend to get. I'm mean, there's very few things that I get hyper emotional about. Like okay. you know, like my my dead late wife. I would get hyper emotional about, but you know, if somebody like scratched up, you know, my car, I'd be like, ah, fuck, it sucks. That guy's a fucking douchebag. But I wouldn't be like, oh my god, I can't deal with this, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it's probably because you've been through so much bigger. You have dealt with death. You have been faced with death. You've been threatened by death. And he's like, these are things that you can't come back from. So it's like everything else, it's not as bad. It's not as bad. Yeah. yeah, So like, yeah, you know, I've been through worse. Yeah, no, I I can see that as possible. I mean, you know, I I haven't like put it all linearly down and gone, well, this led to this, led to this. But yeah, Mm -hmm. no, I I can totally see that. Yeah. Like I also know... uh, I think it's kind of like the human condition where like, you know, when you're in your twenties, you're more black and white about everything. And you mm-hmm. see a lot more gray areas. You're a lot more, you, you have a lot wider perspective when you're older. Right. You know? And like mm-hmm. I'm 49 now and so I see things way differently than I did in my twenties. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And probably different than you saw five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully was, you're always like evolving, getting a little right. bit better, and you know. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I always say, you know, every day that you wake up, it's an opportunity to learn something new and to grow as a person. True. So, yeah. You know, I don't. I honestly don't want to be. I want to be a better version of myself than I was yesterday. You know. 
And that's, I think that's a good goal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, man. So what I'm going to do is right now I have this uh, segment of the show called Flip the Script. What okay. I'm going to do, I'm going to take all the pictures that I sent you and I'm going to turn them upside down. I'm going to tell you what I see. Okay. In all of these pictures. Okay. Now, this will be my very first time seeing these pictures upside down. Yes, I turned them upside down, but I haven't like really dissected them. And, you know, I just looked at it long enough to know that it was upside down, but I didn't really sit there and dissect it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what I see. Based okay. off of what I see, I want you to ask me a question based off of any one. We're going to, you can just pick one of these pictures and just ask me a question based off of what I see. Okay. Okay. All right, so here's the this one. So this is the original. This is the one where you say you saw the two old men laughing. Right. So here it is upside down. Okay. okay. So upside down, this looks like um uh it looks like two roosters that are looking at each other and they are they're balancing on something. Nah, maybe they're not balancing on something. Maybe, maybe they're passing gas and like, and it's like emitting this black cloud <laughs> that's going up, that's like under them. And then, um, they, I, I guess, on top, at the top of it. I don't know. It still looks like part of a rooster, but they really, they look like these Hasa Diddy roosters who have, um, like moved up in class so they were able to get this this uh like a top feather uh an extra feather to go on top of their other feathers because they are like the the top of the class roosters so good luck with that one um <laughs> <laughs> all right so this one is the two dogs uh sniffing each other out and here it is upside down so upside down it looks like it looks like two people hunched over with gas masks on their face. Actually, it looks like two pigs. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it looks like. It's like two pigs. But I, I think there's actually a, a comic series where they're like pigs with gas masks on. And, oh, really? You know, they try and play them up, I think, is like more or less like the Nazis, like the evil, and yeah. It's been oh, wow. a while, but I, I think I recall that. Okay, well, well, that's what I see. I see these two little Nazi pigs then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other picture, so the warrior angel attacking you. And upside down. This is it upside down. This looks like, this looks like, I see a dragon. I see a, yeah, I see a dragon. And he's flying, has his, his wings out. Looks like he has wings and arms. And right there at the bottom, that's the face. That's the face of the, the dragon. Right, no, I can see that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so what question do you, well, which picture do you want? first all right well let's go back to the first one this is probably the the one that um uh, i most can really thought about and then time to dissect um i mean when i saw that i see like two older women like kneeling towards each other um but i i think like i don't know this, this might be a deeper psychological thing but it seems like everything that you saw you saw them more as animals and I saw them more as people. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're kind of like crude, distorted, almost like I would say like a little bit like rough and angry. So maybe I'm seeing people as the real monsters and you're, you're seeing animals. So, okay. I'll tell you what, you can ask me a question based off of any of these, but I want to come back to what you just said in okay. a second about people being monsters but um so okay so what question did you want to ask you know, you want to ask the question based off of this picture well yeah what why did roosters come to mind i mean i can see the the resemblance to roosters if i if i struggle 
you know, mm -hmm. if I go, okay, let me look at it through your eyes. Let me try and see, okay, I, I can see how that can be interpreted as roosters. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, were you, did you grow up on a farm? Do you have relatives <laughs> with the farm? You know, have you had a lot of experience with them? You know, what made you jump to roosters? Um, so I, no, I did not grow up on a farm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I grew up in D.C. We don't have any farms. There was there's a place in D.C. in Southeast D.C. called Berry Farms, and there's nothing farm about it. It is the hood. And I, I lived in D.C. for three years. Yeah, right. That's right. So you you probably familiar. Yeah. yeah. So no, but um, um, I I don't know why. I, I mean that's that's just what I saw. They just look like they just look like roosters to me. Um, I don't think that um. You know, the, the funny thing about these pictures is, you know, I'll look at it and I'll see one thing one day. Tomorrow, I may look at that and I may see the people. I may not see okay. roosters anymore. But today, now I'll say this, where I live now, I live on the eastern shore of Maryland. And there's a lot of farms out here. <laughs> it's a lot of farms out here, man. And, Do you um, think that added to it? Like that that helped like twist your opinion a little bit? Um, Probably not. I mean, they just... <laughs> <laughs> They just look like roosters to me. <laughs> like I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't even know if there's a deep psychological explanation for why I saw that. Okay. You know? Um, and maybe, maybe if I spent some more time looking at the picture, um, I may be able to pull back some, peel back some layers and and go a little bit deeper. But as I look at, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna put it back up. And now I just want to see if I see something different. Um. Um, of course, I still see the roosters. Oh, you you know what's funny? You know what rooster I see? I see the Kellogg's um, cornflakes rooster. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and I, mean, I didn't grow up in a farm, so it probably like the the iconograph, you know, graphic images are, are that you're familiar with would probably be more or less what I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't hang out on the farms or anything like that. Like, I don't, <laughs> I just. No, I, I, I no, no, but I'm saying is it's like I, I've probably seen them the same way you have. Like, I've seen cartoons or illustrations oh, right. of them. I haven't seen them in person. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, I've been to a couple of farms. It's, it's like, it's, it's this one particular farm out here where I actually go to get some meat from. So, you know, I can buy like sausage and bacon and, you know, but it's straight from the farm. That's probably the best way to get it. Yeah, oh it's much gosh, fresh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's amazing. It's amazing. I get that stuff, come right home, go to my backyard and throw it on the grill. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, it's amazing, man. So I but you know what, man? I want to go back to what you said about um humans being monsters. So I feel like I feel that uh when we were kids that um, one of the biggest lies that is told to us, and it's not an intentional lie, because it is actually, I don't even necessarily want to call it a lie, because when it's said to us, it's not said in the form of a lie, it's said in the form of the truth. But I think that one of the biggest misconceptions is that monsters are not real. Right. And, you know, you, you know, you spend your childhood being afraid of monsters and having your parents try to convince you no there's no such thing as monsters and then you get to an age where you realize okay monsters aren't real and then you get older and you start dealing with enough people and seeing enough things and you realize monsters are very real but monsters are human they're not right this big scary hairy monster that you thought that it was when you were a kid it's not it comes in the form of somebody that looks just like me somebody that looks just like you and it's um and those monsters are a lot scarier <laughs> than than the monsters well, also it seems yeah. like with a lot of animals like the reason why they they react that way is not because they're malevolent but because maybe they're protecting their their kids like the cubs maybe they're protecting their food source like they it seems like there's something else other than that. I just want to fuck you up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can, you know, you walk by animals and they won't just jump out and attack you. But if you get too close, they feel threatened. If you get right. too close to their eggs or to their, their babies, then 
you know bears and, especially yeah. like adult bears are mm-hmm. way more tame when they don't have cubs around but when they have the cubs around then they get ferocious because they feel like they have to protect them right yeah yep and, and that's understandable that's understandable especially especially if we're talking about animals that are familiar with humans and what humans do to animals right so you immediately see the human and immediately think enemy they're coming to kill me i gotta go get them first you know which is part of the reason i stay out of the woods man like i don't <laughs> well you know people kill a lot more animals than animals yeah yeah absolutely i was i was watching something recently about shark attacks yeah and um uh, that's somebody, one of the exact things i was thinking about yeah yeah but somebody somebody said um i can't i'm trying to remember exactly what it was but it's like if you are in their home how is it that they're attacking you right <laughs> you know that's their home that's their home imagine somebody just walking into your home you well, know you know that um often sharks don't they don't really like people like they they just see them as like not worth the time and not that delicious and not whatever so mm-hmm. usually when a shark attacks a person there's like some other thing involved like they don't know what it is they see like the edge of a surfboard or whatever right. so they're like I, I don't know it might be a dolphin it might be a fish you mm-hmm. know or they're like old and they're sick, so they, they feel like they can't go after anything that's like faster or more agile, but they have to eat to live. Right. So yeah. but it, it's it's actually kind of rare. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Shark attacks are very rare. Mm-hmm. Yep. I actually have in this tank right here, I got two sharks in there. Oh yeah, what do you have? Um, so one is a um I almost said bala. I had a bala in that tank over there, but it died. Mm-hmm. Um over here I have a rainbow shark and then i have a um african <laughs> it's called an african something shark. i can't remember the name of it i can't remember salt it. water no no it's fresh water no oh, okay mm-hmm. yep. yeah i always wanted to get uh for one of the tattoo shops uh i've owned three tattoo shops over time mm-hmm. two of them they uh didn't work out i was like i'll never own one and then years later I opened up this one and this one's been really successful but mm-hmm. uh the the second one i really wanted to get a tank and i wanted to put sharks in it and mm-hmm. i also wanted to put stingrays because apparently the i wanted to put hammerhead sharks and apparently they get along with stingrays they don't kill each other oh really yeah but so, it was on the second floor and i was like we need a giant salt water tank and you know mm-hmm. that would probably okay. just crash to the floor and then you know the landlord would uh um. curious <laughs> <laughs> man i so how big does the tank have to be for a stingray I, I mean it's been a while it's been a long time but i i remember it was like it was some huge number of gallons that we needed like a like a 500 gallon tank or something you know mm. and like you know things only get as big as their tank allows them mm-hmm. you know and it's kind of cruel to like put like a giant creature in this tiny little fucking tank right but i remember like i wanted like a couple hammerheads a couple sing rays mm-hmm. and for that we needed this giant fucking tank and it right. wasn't even how big the tank was it was the weight of that tank full of water right. on the second floor yeah 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 i can see that i can see that i've always thought okay when it's time to move I- <laughs> how am i going to get this tank out of here <laughs> like this thing is not not so much this one but that one <laughs> like how am i going to get this tank out of here with you know but I, I'm, I'm assuming i'll probably have to take the you know the fish out put them in something smaller you know have them in a bag right. or something and then what do you have in that nothing right now nothing okay. i've been i've been taking months to uh to get this tank together to um just prepare it for whatever i I've been really particular about what I wanted to put in here. So I'm just taking my time. It's been empty since April. But okay. and that was when my uh, my shark died. And I had that shark for nine years. Right. Wow. Yeah. So but I how long do they live normally? That one, the one that I had, that shark, the lifespan is about 10 years. Okay. Yep. But um, but he's really good to run, basically. Yeah, yeah. Plus he was sick. He got sick. You know, there was this growth on his on his side um he also had something growing on his eye so 
yeah, he just he, he was sick. So yeah, man. But um, but yeah, soon, soon I'm gonna I'm gonna get some some more fish uh to go in that one. I was actually looking at lobsters. Okay. Um, um but you know, but it's the, the small lobsters, no, not the not the big ones, because the big ones would not survive here because I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna eat them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so have you seen uh the series The Boys? No, no, but I keep hearing that it's really good. Really, really good. But they have one guy that's kind of like their Aquaman. He's called the Deep. Uh-huh. You know, they're, they're all the superheroes, by the way, are douchebags. So okay. he's a big douchebag. But like you know, animals talk to him. So he's like in a, in a like a store, like a you know stop and shop or giant or whatever mm-hmm. type of store, like a supermarket. And they have a tank with a bunch of lobsters. And one of the lobsters start talking to him. He's like. Hey, buddy, I'm going to get you out of there. Okay. So he tells the guy, he's like, yeah, let me get that lobster. And the guy goes, oh, that's one. All right. Chop. Chop the head off. <laughs> <He's> like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I, um, oh, you know what? Actually, <laughs> I watched the first episode of The Boys, but I didn't go back to it. But I do want to finish that, though. So. Dude, it gets, it gets more extreme as it goes along. Really? Like, it's gotten to the point where you're like, how did they get away with that on TV? Really? Yeah. Okay. It's good. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. <laughs> well, all right, man. We're going to go ahead and wrap up now. Um, but before we do, I just want you to let everybody know how they can get in contact with you um, and everything that you have going on. <laughs> Well, probably the best source is my website. Like, I have a blog in there, so whatever I'm up to, you know, I put it in the blog. It's uh, danhink.com. And uh, I have a a Facebook page, and I have an Instagram. I even have a TikTok page. I don't do those little dances with, uh, like, Pink Tutu. Maybe. You know, we'll we'll see. But uh, so far, I haven't done those. But uh, you kind of got, if you're an artist, you kind of have to have everything. At least I feel like you do, just to get yourself out there. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, I have the I have the podcast too, so you can't really see what I'm up to with the podcast. It's more like you know I'm interviewing other people, but uh, that's also Dan Hink on YouTube. But uh, I would check out the podcast, and then you can go to the website and see if I'm up to anything interesting. Okay, and what about your books? How can people get your books? They're all available on Amazon. They're available on Barnes and Nobles. The latest one is uh, available on Audible. So it's available, and actually, it turns out that that's the bestseller. So a lot of people don't read; mm-hmm. they, I guess, love to hear books. But uh, okay. you can check them. You can check them out on all those sites. Plus, like the publisher is Crossroad Press. Um, but Amazon is probably the best. I mean, you can get everything off Amazon. You can probably buy a fucking tank or a bazooka off Amazon. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you can't. I try. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, man. Well, before we get out of here, I have one more picture that I want to show you, and I want you to tell me exactly what you see. Okay. <laughs> now you can go ahead and say it. <laughs> uh, it says, this podcast is so dope. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your transparency, just being so open and honest and sharing your story, man. I think that that story is um, it's a, it's a really, really deep story. And I feel like we only scratched the surface. There's so much more to that story. But um, also want to give people enough to want to come back to you so they can come to your books, so they can come to your podcast so they can come to your tattoo yeah, shop. Book you is, uh, the end of the world. So everybody should run out and buy that. <laughs> <laughs> you, I hold personally on. think it's awesome. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, say, say that again. It's called the end of the world. Uh huh. And I said, yeah. I personally think it's awesome. I mean, I might be slightly subjective, but you know, <laughs> well, you know what, based off of the conversations that you and I have had and this interview, I believe it. I believe that it is awesome. I mean, yeah, I I just hear your creativity. I hear your um your intelligence. You know, I just I really and the fact that you you are so detailed. I think the fact that you are a tattoo artist and a writer, it speaks to the level of detail that you put into your work. Okay, well, 
I hope so. Uh, one thing I try to do, and it kind of bugs me that some writers don't do it, is I try to put myself in the mindset of whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if it's not me, I try to put myself in somebody else's mindset when something happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yep. like, what they smell, I smell. What they, they see, I see, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the mark of a, of a great creator. Thank you. Yep, yep. You're welcome, man. All right, man. Well, again, thank you for your time. And for everybody else, y'all be good to each other. <laughs>